if you know me, I'm Keaton Douglas. I'm delighted to be uh, sharing this with you. So many faces that I know and so many new faces that I welcome. And I'm really very excited and thrilled to be here um, as, uh, as a board member of the Center of Addiction and Faith in Minnesota. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Katie Wilbur, who is um, our, our communications coordinator and director for the Center of Addiction and Faith, who are joining us today and kind of making things move smoothly. And I am delighted to have the opportunity to introduce you to a book that I wrote with our co-author, Lindsay Schlegel, who will be joining us not today, but on another day. She is, God bless her, the mom of five <laughs> little ones. So sometimes during the day, these sex, this is a time things don't necessarily work out so well for her, but she promised me that before our study is over, that she would indeed join us. Um, if you know me, then uh, I, I usually do two things when I when I start. I usually uh, I always have to pray, and I always I usually sing. But this isn't the best uh, forum for singing, so I'll hold off on the music for now. Um, but I will ask us all if we could join in prayer as we begin this session. I'll lead in a, a very short prayer for all of us as we bow our heads and we ask our heavenly father, good and gracious God, we are your loving children. And we are so thrilled and so humbled to be together today in your presence. We ask that you fill us with the Holy Spirit, that you imbue our hearts with your love, a love that is so deep and so powerful and so beautiful that it will carry through to us and to all those that we seek to serve. May we always seek to be beacons of light, to all those who exist in the tangled portion of your vineyard, we will always seek to toil there. In your name, we pray all of this. Amen. 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 Well, so exciting to see everybody. Again, I welcome you here. I want to give you a little bit of an understanding of how uh, our session will hopefully proceed today. Um, I had sent out, Katie had actually sent out something that uh, said that we were looking at the introduction and chapter one. In each one of these sessions, we will be discussing two chapters, in this case, the intro and the chapter uh, for uh, of the book, The Road to Hope. And so I'd like to do it this way, that I'd like to give you um, a little bit of a talk about what my intention was with regard to the intro and then I'd like to entertain maybe 10 or 15 minutes of questions. I probably won't get to all of them, but uh, to talk about it a little bit. And then to do so the same thing with chapter one, I'll give you what my intention was, what I hoped to have you take away from it. And then I'd love to hear your takeaways. Um, at the very end of our session, the perhaps like the last 15 or 20 minutes, we're going to break out into rooms just a few. And for about 15 minutes, I'd like to have you talk amongst yourselves. I'm going to give you one of the reflection questions and I'll give you a little bit further instruction about how to do this You're when so we funny. get there um, to talk to you about uh, a reflection question that I want you to think about and ponder. Then we'll come back into the main session. And when we come back into the main session, we will say a closing prayer. I'll give you directives for next week and we will move on uh, in faith. Amen. 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 Another thing I, I just wanted to share with you is um, we are indeed blessed because we have people of all different denominations here. When I wrote this book, I'm a Keaton Douglas, a Roman Catholic, and I wrote it because I perceived that my own faith, which was a very large church, which has a lot of organization to it, was doing very little. And I wrote it from the perspective of hoping to change my church. However, whenever it says Catholic, please, this expands to your faith tradition, to your denomination, to wherever you are at. This works for you as well. This, when we are working with our brothers and sisters suffering from the disease of addiction, is ne'er a time to look at any differences. This is a time when we come together as children of God, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to begin this walk together, a time when we can truly disregard any differences and embrace it. As far as I'm concerned, if you have a love of the Lord and a deep desire to help those on the margins, you are in, I love you, and I thank you for being here. 
All right. So I just wanted to put that put that aside for now. Um, I'd like to begin today's discussion with the poem that starts my book. I didn't write it. It's beautiful. It was written by a woman that has taken my course, who is the mother of a son who suffered from addictions for years, and thanks be to God, now has eight years of sobriety. She is a poet, she is a theologian, she is a professor. Her name is Lynn O'Gorman Latchford. And this uh, is at the beginning of the book. It's a poem called Unbearable. And what it speaks to is a parent looking at a child who suffers. And I know many of you, because I know many of you, have been in this position. And I want you to hear it through Lynn's eyes and her words. Unbearable. The pain in your eyes, unbearable to see. Rushing to you, my impulse to stay close. Don't let go, carry you through. And your Christ eyes pierce my soul. My God, my God, I can't abandon you. The reality, waiting. No intrusiveness upon your agony. Slack with grief watching you breathing in and out to pass the time. Tiredness all around you. And your Christ eyes pierce my soul. My God, my God, I can't abandon you. Resignation overtaking you and I am silent waiting for the moment to embrace you, absorb you, pull you through me, suffering cast out. And your Christ eyes pierce my soul. My God, my God, I can't abandon you. So those of you who know me know I get a little emotional from things like this. Part of the reason is I work with so many parents and I know this feeling and I'm blessed that it's not a feeling that I have for my own son, but I have many spiritual sons and daughters. And so uh, this resonates greatly. And when I read this to me, it reminds me of why we do things like this, why we gather together in community to come up with solutions, to take back into our faith communities that we can begin making the change, a change of bringing the ineffable love and mercy of God to those who are in our families, in our communities and beyond. So the first chapter of our book that Lindsay and I wrote, The Road to Hope, is uh, the first introduction, um, explains a lot about why we're here today. But I wanted to share with you what our purpose of this book was. The book was not only to better understand this disease as a disease of mind, body, and spirit, but it was also created as a tool. It's a tool to equip you, to empower you, and to encourage you to make sure that you can be the agent of change in your own faith community, wherever you are at, whatever faith community you are in. The Center of Addiction and Faith and my community, which is I Thirst, share a mission. And the mission is to awaken faith communities to the fact that they have a responsibility to help serve those who suffer from the disease of addiction and their families who are sitting so often in the pews underheard and underserved. We're hopeful to change that. Right now, about a, a second about I Thirst, we uh, are a mission of the Missionary Servants of the Most Holy Trinity, that is a community of Catholic priests and brothers who have been working in the field of addiction for 102 years. We are blessed and privileged to carry on their work. However, we begin training people, and now so many of you on this call are part of this team. We have trained more than 300 people who are worldwide. We are proud to say that we have now uh, got people working as I Thirst spiritual companions, being that resource person in our faith communities in 41 different states, as far out as American Samoa and Pago Pago. We're in Dublin, Ireland. 
Uh, we are in Costa Rica. We are completely bilingual. And now we are teaching um, and, and participating in the opening of a retreat center and uh, a treatment facility in Abuja, Nigeria, Nairobi, Kenya, and also in Johannesburg, South Africa, because this is a worldwide problem. And one of the things that we talk about in chapter one, or the introduction, I should say, is the title of it is, it's not someone else's problem. And this isn't someone else's problem. And the numbers bear us out. The National Center of uh, Drug Abuse Statistics, the NCDAS, keeps statistics on a dashboard. Currently in the United States of America, where there are 335 million individuals, 40 million of them, age 12 and over, are suffering from some sort of substance use disorder. And that's irrespective of all those that are suffering from other non-chemical uh, addictions, pornography, gambling, uh, shopping, overeating, uh, 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 all sorts of, of, of attachment disorders. Amen. Uh, so many people are afflicted. So that means with 40 million individuals afflicted, and with their family members afflicted as well, right? Because they're, every person that's afflicted has at least two or three persons that is directly suffering because of their, their addiction. That means that if we did that math, there's literally 100 million people out of the 335 million Americans that are some way affected by this disease, that wake up in the morning with anxiety over their loved one's addiction or their own. Brothers and sisters, do you know what that means? That means that every community has a drug and alcohol problem. It means that every faith community, everyone has a drug and alcohol problem. It means every school, it means every university, it means every employment situation, it is literally everywhere. And therefore it no longer is someone else's problem. This is a universal crisis that we must participate in its uh, remediation. So why do you think our faith communities have been so reticent I, to, to, to play a role in this? And I think largely it has had to do with the fact that we didn't think we had a role to play because we didn't understand the nature of the disease as a disease of mind, body, and spirit. Um, those that suffered from the disease of addiction seemed other to our faith communities, other. And if you didn't have to suffer, if you didn't know someone or you weren't suffering yourself, then that was those people. Have you heard that expression? Those people. And what we're trying to do is to say, we are those people. We are all those people. Why do we say that? Because Sacred scripture bears out the fact that we are all prone to unruly behaviors. We are all prone to, to compulsions that we, that we have a difficult time controlling. We have looked at, we, we need to look no further than the beginning of our sacred scripture in, in, in the Bible in Genesis. When we look at the story of the fall of Adam and Eve and the themes that come from that story, the themes of pride and self-centeredness, the themes of rebellion, and even just curiosity, all of these things that play into why a person would use. And so St. Paul in his letter to the Romans, you know how in, in uh, his letter to the Romans in chapters five through eight, which is wonderful, great Lenten reading. In chapters five through eight, he talks about specifically about sin and deliverance, sin and deliverance from sin. In chapter seven, and if you take my course, I, I reiterate this over and over again. St. Paul says these words and more, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. St. Paul, the greatest evangelist of the Christian faith, arguably, himself was prone to unruly desires. Himself was tortured by compulsions to do something he didn't want to do. Thanks be to God, we don't know what that was. 
because now it speaks to all of us. It speaks to all of us, whether we are suffering from a chemical uh, addiction, it speaks to us if we are speak, you know, have a, an, an addiction to pornography, whatever it is, a compulsion to do something. Because the 40 million people in our country who are suffering from the disease of addiction at this time, who are in active addiction, I, I tell you, no one wants to wake up dope sick. Nobody wants to wake up with a hangover. It is compulsion to do other than that which they want to do. I tell the story in the book, probably in a later chapter, that talks about when I was working in an inner city detox and a gentleman came in to me and he had been there. He was wearing scrubs and he was uh, very disheveled and whatnot. And I had seen him over and over again. And he sat down across from me and he said, Keaton, I don't know why I do these things. I don't want to do these things. I know what I should be doing, but I can't do what I want to do. I'll never forget him. His name was Rahim. I said, Rahim. I said, brother, you are basically paraphrasing St. Paul. This is a human condition. We are all prone to it. And so when we're talking about uh, the disease of addiction, in the book, we rely very heavily on the work of Dr. Gerald G. Mays. Um, I hope some of you have read his wonderful watershed book, Addiction and Grace, because it is he who wrote this book about 40 years ago. He was a psychiatrist that wrote, I would say probably the uh, watershed book about the, the synthesis of addiction and spirituality and really explained it so beautifully for us. And he said, you know what, we are all called to have a relationship to be loved by our creator but our addictions get in the way we are called to love our god to love our fellows and to love ourselves the gospel of matthew will tell us in chapter 22 and as well as the gospel of mark those are the two great commandments yet something gets in our way the thing that gets in our way is our unnatural attachments or what we would call our addictions things that when i teach i put my hand up to my face because all we see then is ourselves and it Whatever this is, it becomes our, our lover, our God, our modern idol, our false idol. Because nothing can take the place of the God of our understanding, but the God of our understanding. So it necessarily will fail anytime we try to substitute that with a chemical or, and behavior or something of that nature. So our addictions are also our unnatural attachments, acute unnatural attachments to things. Where do they come from? Dr. May talks about it. He said, you know, so many of us have these repressed feelings. We have things. I, I own a horse farm. So if you've taken my class, you've heard this story a billion times. I own a horse farm. I do horse chores in the morning. And after I leave you, I'm going to go bring in the herd at night. Every day in the morning, I got my wheelbarrow. You know what I'm shoveling, right? Mm -hmm. You know. And it reminds me, every time I put that big fork into everything, it reminds me that we each have our pile of our own steaming manure. Our repressed memories, our feelings, our anxieties, all of those things that we seek to repress, to pack down. The problem is if we don't delve into them and figure out what they are, they come back to wreak emotional havoc on us. And what happens is when we, we don't deal with those repressed memories, the things that are in our proverbial wheelbarrow, we will pick up an agent or a natural attachment to try to numb us from the feelings. We use chemicals or behaviors. We create these addictions because we either want to feel something or we want to feel nothing feel something or feel nothing. The thing is that we all have our piles. We all have our wounds. We all have our brokenness. In the beginning, I tell my whole story about the, the uh, uh, unexpected demise of my first marriage, the unforgiveness that I harbored, the resentment that 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 took over my body like a corrosion. Um, that was my wound. That was my wound. That was my hurt. I described to you the very first time that I went and I spoke to those women at a retreat. And I didn't think they wanted to hear anything I had to say because I had never smoked marijuana. And the women I met with were heroin addicts. 
And yet the beauty of that meeting changed my life because I realized at that time that there was nothing that was different. We were wounded women that were seeking a spiritual healing, a healing that I had found that I wanted to share. The point of my introduction with Lindsay to this book is we are mutually wounded and it is in that woundedness, in that very brokenness that I can begin to see the woundedness of others, to see for me the face of Christ in them, but to see myself in them. When I see myself in the wounds of somebody else, even if those wounds were different, just like those women, their wounds were from addiction, mine were from adultery. Guess what? It didn't matter. We were broken and needed community. We were broken and needed support. We were broken and we needed the spiritual healing that only the Lord could give us. And that day, what we found was compassion and love and mercy in each other. We found community. That's the beginning of where we need to go. When I look into someone who suffers, I look to see the face of Christ in them. I look to see my face in them. I look to see my suffering in them. When I see that, I know that there is no other, that we can dispel the myth of the other to make a change. And I know we got to start doing that right now. At this point, I'd like to entertain if any of you have questions, I could take a few questions or or comments about your thoughts or feelings on that introduction. I see so many smiling faces that I know. Hi, Marty. <laughs> thoughts, comments, questions about just the introduction, anything that we've just gone over as part of our reading. I'm glad that I'm making this. <laughs> Keaton, this is Margaret. I talk a lot. I'll try not to talk too much. Um, Margaret. First off, I'm just grateful to hear your style. I haven't read your book yet, but I've got a pretty great library and you bet Dr. Mays on my bookshelf, Amen. but I haven't immersed in it. And if he's seminal in this, I'm super excited. I just yes. found out that Bill W's yes. seminal work was varieties of religious experiences by James. I'm like, William James, I'm like, okay. Wow. But I think we need to go back to the four, 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 four parents who write about this and yes. first discovered this. What I'm um, feeling right now is just the inspiration of your ability to preach and how I need to find my voice Amen. and what a courage it is to even put in the chat. My son's 21. I'm a member of Al-Anon, you know, and I'm grateful and I'm recovering and I'm learning from this the, the addiction vicariously, but to recognize that all of us have process and formation and beingness of compulsion. Oh yes. yeah. So, yes. but mostly I just wanted to say, as I listen to you, I can actually see myself having my voice and it's hard to get a voice. You, you have to see it modeled. And I think that is the, the real rock of preparing our congregations, you know, to not just say it, but to say a little bit more about it. So thank you. I'm, I'm so happy Margaret, to hear your you. voice. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing that. I, uh, I appreciate it. Yes. Let us all find a way to have our voices, to express it. You know why it's easy to express because it's the truth. It's the truth. Amen. Thank you, Margaret. Sherry. So I am, I am newly foraying into the addiction, which my daughter has developed one. So I am, I went through the iThirst program and it's interesting right now to hear from her perspective and everything we're learning from them. You know, you talk about the wounds and we're learning about the complex trauma and it's so important right now for everyone, no matter what faith they walk, because right now insurance is dropping the ball. These kids have no safety nets, especially these young people, 18 to 20, mm. like the 18 year olds, because they're adults to 25, because their brains haven't formed are basically being told, you know what, just keep relapsing, just keep relapsing. And that is the mm. merry-go-round they're on and they have nowhere to turn. 
and to have whatever faith play, you know, somewhere that they can go to and get that community. Cause that's my daughter. She's like, mom, I can't leave this facility. I will relapse. And we, I'm fighting right now to find where to put her next. That's going to keep her in that, you know, cocoon to give her that time to heal and grow. So this is so critical. Thank you, Keaton. Thank Sherry, you for the journey you're on. Absolutely. We're always, always praying for our loved ones um, that have these issues. And what Sherry says is absolutely right, that we need the development of community and uh, community building aftercare more than just the meetings the meetings are great but we need more than that yeah. and we need to participate as all faith communities to really this is what i say you know what i say get fired up get fired mm -hmm. up we yeah. have a lot of work to do father ed my wonderful friend please thank you is my volume on yes it is sir okay super um <clears throat> my comment relates to um awareness of the of the uh, situation the statistics that you have are absolutely helpful the problem is certain pockets of the church and i'll say our communities um the, we're in a maintenance mode instead of a missionary mode ah. and instead of seeing this as a mission as something to approach and deal with and spread the good news that we do have a God of healing and forgiveness and, and mercy. We're too busy protecting the turf and it blinds people to see how, and I'm choosing my words politely and carefully, you are. <laughs> how very pervasive addictions are in our communities. Thank you, Father Ed. For, for those of you that don't know, Father Ed Rienz uh, runs a beautiful programs, multiple programs. He wears many hats out in Youngstown, Ohio, where he is single-handedly really with a team that he has put together, really working to bring awareness of addiction. He has run Cafe Augustine, which is like a recovery cafe for those of you that attended our um our Center of Addiction and Faith. There was a breakout room on Recovery Cafe. He runs one of the, the first out there in Ohio. He's got many different programs and many different people working with him. He is in the trenches. I'm going to go to Anna and then I'm going to go back. Sherry, did you have another comment that you wanted to make? I just real quick wanted to say um, thank you, Father, because I feel that 100% the missionary, that's what it's been coming to my heart is there was a time when we needed schools, we needed hospitals, and we had people of the church that, you know, the sisters that were stepping up and really forging that. And I feel like this is where we are right now. This Amen. is our because we don't have treatment centers. We don't have right. places that people can go, like you said, the community. So yeah, I feel like this is a huge missionary. It, perfect, Sherry. Thank you. I agree. Anna. Um, I'm an Al Anon. Um, I've been going Al Anon. With I guess seven years, and my husband is a recovered AA, and so this is very dear to our hearts. We're actively going to our meetings, and um, our priest, um, we met with him, and he, we were just kind of throwing around, what can we do for mm -hmm. for this, and he mentioned the eye thirst, gave us the notebook to look over, Wow! and so we're real interested in just knowing how to uh, do we just let people know that we know about meetings and that we can, well, we want to be there for people that are in the same 100%. Uh, situation. The cafe thing is, is something I've thought about before, yeah. but I don't know anything about how to do that, but we just don't know how to even start this. Stay tuned. Like, okay. <laughs> for the rest of the book, ladies and gentlemen, because we are going to roll out a path. And for those of you who are more interested in taking our 48-hour course with certification, another course will begin. It's virtual. You get uh, online certification through Seton Hall University and I Thirst, and it will begin on April 9th. I'm going to, the next time, Katie, next week, we will post the, uh, the link to it if you're interested. Res, uh, registration is now open. So we are training people. I see many of you here have been trained by our, by our group. Um, and uh, I see even my wonderful priest, Father Vitalis, 
who is here from uh, just outside of Abuja, Nigeria, where he will be uh, founding one of the largest, probably the largest treatment facility in all of Western Africa. And we are mentoring father and his team and very proud and privileged to do so. So, so many of you are here, are getting it, are getting fired up and we're going out to do it. And we're gonna lay that path out for you. But the introduction to this book was about, this is what we gotta do. We've gotta dispel the myth of the other. We've gotta get fired up in our faith communities. And we have to see ourselves in the suffering of others. So with that being said, I'm going to take it over and talk to you a little bit now about chapter one. Again, we will have questions and then we'll have a, a wonderful breakout session. So chapter yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, can, uh, yeah. One thing, give you some scriptural uh, ammunition for your horse manure uh, <laughs> deal. The, the, you can use uh, Philippians chapter three. Uh, verse 8b, depending on your translation, uh, some say garbage, refuse, but the word, the Greek word is scubalo, which literally means manure. Ah! <laughs> that is perfect. What's that, Philippians 3, did you say? Uh, Philippians 3, 8b. <laughs> that is marvelous. I could have... <laughs> I couldn't love that more. Thank you so much. That is, you're do welcome. you see when you're led by the truth, it just emerges, right? The truth is revealed. Thank you so Amen, much. Sister. What a blessing that is. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And as we move into chapter one, the chapter that we are talking about now is we are not immune. We are not immune. This chapter of our book begins with a mother, another mother, I work a lot with family members, right? And this, if we we cannot ignore the family members, so many of them that that sit there in silence and in such pain, begins with the mother's expression of love for her son's struggle and for his wounds. She understands his wounds and how she was drawn closer to Christ's wounds by recognizing her son's agony and, and struggle as Christ's very own and bringing brought there. For those of you that have taken our course, this of course was written by Melinda. Uh, Melinda is one of our teammates that lost her son on September 22nd, 2018, uh, and has become a warrior in trying to get all of our faith communities to awaken to the fact that we've got a big role to play in the spiritual healing of our brothers and sisters. This chapter speaks a lot about the wounded healer. For those of you that have read Henry Nouwen, who was the Dutch theologian and priest that wrote about the wounded healer. And the thought is that those who minister to others can make their deepest connection to their God through their own suffering. So it's interesting because in, in my story, as you read, my suffering was not because of addiction. My suffering was because of adultery. But when I looked at it as suffering and not, wow, my experience was so different than yours. When I looked at it and just said, you are suffering the way I am. I felt isolated. I felt alone. I felt shame. I felt guilt for not being able to keep a marriage together. All of these things. I felt resentment because of the way that it happened. Anger. The same feelings that they had had given the, 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 the parameters of their own addictions. Um, I used my wounds to help me understand and accompany those women, even though the wounds were very different. And so we talk about this and understand that every one of us is really susceptible to, to any sort of unnatural attachment. And in the book, we talk about, you know, the way Dr. Gerald G. May talks about addiction. What does that mean? And I just want to say a word or two, if I may, about the difference between an attachment and an actual addiction. I think that's important. And of course, you know, in, in the book, we, we talk about it a bit. In the course, we, we mention it quite a lot because it's important to understand. Each one of us, if we look with intellectual honesty in our lives, right? We look back on our lives and we say, there have been times, perhaps even now, where I am attached to something. And this attachment 
to a behavior or a thing keeps me from my intimacy, my growing intimacy with my God, with my fellows, and even with myself. And we can look at that. We could say, mm, what, what, what might that have been? And it really can be anything, my friends. It could be anything. I know in my life, I had a time when I was a young woman on Wall Street. I was the only gal in my department. This was back in the, the Stone Ages. And I was convinced that I was going to be the first woman assistant vice president. I was going to climb my way up to the top. And I did to the neglect of everything else around me, including the early part of my marriage. Hmm? I became attached to that idea, the idea of prestige, the idea of breaking the glass ceiling. That became my attachment. It distracted me from relationship, relationship with my God, with my fellows, and with myself. And clearly, it was my husband. That became one of my attachments. There have been other times in my life when I was a professional entertainer where the need for self-promotion was my attachment. Now, the difference is if we think about it, and I, and I, I, I share with you this, this story about bringing this to a, a, a catechism. We bring a lot of our work to young people, catechism, confirmation classes, Sunday schools, to talk about you know, how faith communities can support and shepherd our kids into a better spot. And I remember one time I was teaching or giving a talk and it was virtual and um, the parents were there and the kids were there. And I'm talking about attachments that we get attached to things in our lives that keep us from really developing this relationship with God. And there was a little fellow there all by himself, no parents. And this is how his computer looked. All I could see was his eyes and the top of his head. And he raised his hand and he said, I think I have an attachment. He said, I play video games and I can't stop. And my mom tells me I should stop, but I, I think I have an attachment. And you know what? I had one of my guys in community, those of you that know my partner, James, that comes to speak to us often. James said, I'm so proud of you. The little boy's name is Sebastian. I'm so proud of you, Sebastian. I'm so proud of you for recognizing this because our attachments come at us in all different ways. But when do those attachments become addictions or so acute that all we can think about. And that's what Dr. May talks about in this chapter of the book, where we develop a tolerance for it. We need more and more where there's a withdrawal from it. Because I bet if you thought about it, right, maybe you're attached a little bit too much to Netflix or how about, how about this thing? How about social media posting about your family and things like that? We don't even know it because sometimes these things are benign, but they keep us from deepening our faith from deepening our relationship with our God, from deepening our relationship with our fellows. This relationship, this relationship is the very cross itself. Our relationship with our God, with our fellows, the two great commandments, to love our God, to love our fellows as ourselves, that's the very cross itself. Our addictions get in the way when we can only see ourselves and them. St. Thomas Aquinas talks about it, breaks it down and says, there are four major categories for our attachments. They are wealth, pleasure, power, or honor. Think about it. Think about it. Things that we get attached to. So why are our faith communities important now? We are important because addiction is at its root, a spiritual malady. Of course, there are devastating physiological things that are happening. It's a brain disease, for sure. There are maladies that transpire all over a person's body. I, I recount in there, I would sit with John uh, in, in the hospital because he would inject between his toes and he would get cellulitis up and down his legs. I sat, I sat. I know these physiological problems, myocarditis, all sorts of strange infections. Yes, there are psychological problems. There are so many co-occurring disorders with this disease. Probably 80% of the people that suffer from a substance use disorder have a co-occurring disorder with mental health issues. Absolutely, they need to be taken care of. But the hallmarks of the disease of addiction, the isolation, the shame, the guilt, 
These are part of one's spiritual condition and they need spiritual healing. They need spiritual healing that cannot, for various reasons, be afforded to them in a clinical setting. Who then, who then should fill in that gap? My brothers and sisters, this is clearly a disease of mind, body, and spirit. This is clearly a disease of mind, body, and spirit. But for too long, we have neglected the spiritual portion of it. Our faith communities, I will tell you later on in the book, have acted like the priest and the Levite in the story of the Good Samaritan. They are holy and they have walked past the bloodied man in the street. Why? Yes, the cultural context tells us that to touch that person would have made an unholiness about them. They would have touched that person's blood. I get it. But Jesus is the one telling the parable. And what does he say? Who comes and helps him? The Samaritan himself, somebody that would be ostracized for being quote unquote a half breed in that society. It's a cast out. It was the one cast out that came to help. That took the bloodied man and put him on his own beast and paid for him. And Jesus tells this story and he says, who is this man's neighbor? The answer comes back, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go do likewise. That's what we're doing. We're going where faith communities haven't been before. We're going in. We're going in, and that doesn't mean only in your parishes or your congregations. This means we're going into treatment facilities. We're going into correctional facilities. We're going into reentry programs. We're going into hospitals. Wherever there is the need, we will go. Because people like us need to be the ones to provide that spiritual healing. And we need to awaken our faith communities. We got to rattle the cages to let them know. I'm going to read to you the last two paragraphs of page 32, if you'd like to read along with me. As creations of the creator, we are incomplete without his love. We are only complete when we welcome God into our days, into our hearts, and into the dark places in our lives. When we do, we can restore the love that has been distorted. We can again embrace the commandments that tell us who we are and what we're called to do and be. This restoration is what we call recovery. So much pain and suffering surfaces when we work with people struggling with addictions and with substance use disorders in particular. The twist is that this pain and suffering are exactly what give us the key to reestablish communion, harmony, and life. I'd like to take the next couple of minutes to discuss any of your thoughts or questions with regard to, to section uh, chapter one or the introduction if anything has come up. We'll do that for a couple of minutes. And then we're going to try breaking out into little rooms for just 10 or 15 minutes to, I'm going to give you one of the reflection questions and just go around kind of briefly and maybe talk about it a little bit. I want you to start talking. Margaret said, we got to find our voices. Margaret is right. We're not ashamed anymore. We're going to talk about this. We're going to talk loudly. We're going to say it loud. Amen. Come on, you're getting me all fired up. I only had one cup of coffee because I knew I was going to get it. <laughs> A little fired up. Questions, comments, chapter one. Tess. Now, you know, I was going to say something. Far, far, far from when I first started this whole beginning on, on a couple of years ago, I would so not say anything. But um, I loved what you said about us having to get people fired up. I find that I carry my eye thirst cards with me wherever I go. I was handing them out in Portugal. <laughs> So it's, it's not about, it's not about, um, I, I gave them out again the other day. I, I, the other night I went on a commitment uh, to a parish, um, a, a, a church, I should say, not a parish, up in Derry, New Hampshire. And the pastor happened to be a woman. And um, 
she was getting her 31 year medallion. Yeah. And I went up to her afterwards and I explained a little bit about what I do with, with my eye thirst. And I gave her a card. So, and, and I explained to her that it's any denomination and if she needed anybody to come and talk or help her out with anything. So I, I find for me, I tend to, where my life is today and where it was for almost 14 years ago, or even 14 years ago, I am, um, I'm in a whole different place and it's very God centered and God spirited. You're right. It's threefold. This disease is threefold, my mental, physical, and spiritual. We all know that. And, but I find for me, when I speak and I go to speak, I, I don't really talk too much about what happened before. Right. I talk about where I'm at today. And I, and even in, I went to a treatment center a couple of weeks ago and spoke and it was all based on my spirituality and on my belief in my Catholic religion. That's my true, that's my true self. So that's the only thing I can speak about. Mm -hmm. And then the two people with me were totally opposite. I don't believe in that, but, 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 well, that's them. I believe. And somebody actually said to me, when they're in a treatment center, they don't really want to hear about the God thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, when I go to speak, whether it's a treatment center or at a meeting, that's where I'm at today. So that's what I have to say. That's my truth. And um, because without the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. Probably. I understand. I, I and I, I love this test. And let me just let me just draw yep. one little differentiation because. Yep. So the one thing is, it depends whether are whether or not you are there to share your story, your experience, mm -hmm. strength and hope mm -hmm. that then you have to tell your truth. That's you. And that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. We all want to hear that. When I go in, and if you go into a place differently, we can go and provide non-denominational spirituality sessions that mm -hmm. will begin to introduce people to the fact mm -hmm. that spirituality is a necessary dimension of wellness. And that's where the thing like the spiritual breadcrumbs that we talk about. Yes. Come in, right. So I'm not talking about mine. I don't go in and tell them my story of that. Right. There's two different things. There are two different lanes. Yep. If you're going to give your meeting about your things and share your experience, strength, yes. Hope, that's one thing. If I, if you're going into a treatment facility because you've been invited there to give a spirituality session, then when I right. go in, I say to them, it's a necessary dimension. Well, but what does it look like for you? And here's mm -hmm. the thing. For many people in early, if you're going into facilities, whether they're correctional or treatment facilities, you're right. Many people don't do the big G word, the God word yet, yet. So when I come in, I give them an approach. I say, I want you to develop a relationship now with G O O D, that which is good. Because when people remember, we are all conditioned in our DNA to see things that are bad, mm -hmm. right? That's, uh-oh, Neanderthal man. There's some ruffling in the woods. It must be the saber-toothed tiger or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. it's the, you know, it's that kind of thing. It's like, we better run. Like, it's protective. We see right. what is evil. That's part of our DNA. So when we have been under the rock of addiction, under the abyss, whatever that is, when we begin to emerge, if someone comes at us with the G-O-D thing, it can be, for many, off-putting. It doesn't mean that we're not bringing it. Right. If it's we can just right. plant a little seed, that's that, right. That's, all that's it is. Right. A little mustard seed, you know. And that's why I say it's has... not the whole thing that I talk about, exactly. but it's but it's before, during, and after. Yes. If you're giving your story, if you're mm -hmm. going to bring, you know, a spirituality session, which you know, it, it would be a different thing. And I would tell you to focus on good because good leads to beauty, beauty leads to truth, and truth leads to a pursuit of the God of your understanding, whether you know it or not. That's not me, that's St. Edith Stein. I think it's pretty clever, right? So we kind of go in gently, but thank you for sharing that, Tess. I appreciate it. Anna. Um, I was gonna say that when I've had similar situations, sometimes you can say um, God or a higher your higher right. power. Right. And, um, and good is another way to do it. Right. I love right. in, on page 26 where it says addiction is really a desperate response to our desire to fill a hole in the soul that only God can fill. Amen. And I, I've i said this before because I am, I'm Christian. <laughs> so I say this and it's inevitable how many times people will just 
say, yes, I agree with whatever denomination. I don't even ask them about that. Right. Yeah, of course. But we're on the same page. Yep. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. A desire to fill the hole in the soul. What I would like to do right now is um, I'd like to give you a little assignment for the next 15 minutes or so. All right. Would you would you like to do that? Shall we break into? Um, very good, Sharon. Love you. Um, we're going to we're going to break out into breakout rooms. If you don't know how to do that, I'm going to do something on my end of the computer and look on your screen because it'll invite you to join a room. OK, it'll invite you to join a room. Then you just got to click on that little thing that little button, and it's going to put you into a room. And there's there are 34 of you, so there will probably be uh, five rooms or so. And what I want you to do is in, okay, no worries, no worries. But now we're just going to ask a question, and, and you really don't need any prep for this question that I'm going to ask, there's, so there's no worries at all. It is the question, there are, there are two reflection questions in a prayer that always end um, each chapter. At the end of chapter one, there are two questions there. And the one question is, because we're kind of looking at our own weakness and woundedness and brokenness. And the question is, um, have you ever been wounded or broken or felt that way? And how might your experience with brokenness help you accompany another? So what I'm going to ask for, this is what we would do in my class. So those of you in my class know how this goes. So I'm going to ask for some of you to step up and help with this. Um, if you're in a class, you could become the facilitator and just go around. I want to know if you thought about it, has there been something in your life very briefly? Maybe it was a loss of some kind or the loss of a job or the loss of a loved one or something that broke you. And how do you think that might help you see your brokenness in somebody else that you're accompanying? Is that good? Any questions? I'm going to pop in and out of the room. So I'm going to help you along with things like that. But every room needs a facilitator. Step up, my people. And, um, and you know, of course, because we've got time constraints, I will ask you that, to, to, to tell you that brevity will be most uh, appreciated with regard to your commentary so that everyone has an opportunity to go. Um, again, if you wind up taking our course, There'll be a lot of time for us to talk, as you guys all know, but it would be important for you to share a little something or your thoughts about how brokenness, particularly your brokenness, might help you to accompany another down this road. Okay, it's 157. I'm going to break this out. I'm going to close the rooms. Okay, very good, in. I'm going to close the rooms probably uh, a few, like about 12 minutes after the hour. All right, so we can come back and pray. All right, everybody, here we go. Breakout rooms. Okay. Here we go. Ready? And get ready for that little button. With regard to the book, here's your homework. Um, one of the things that, that Katie was so kind to send out was an email uh, that said, if you could read, read and have, be prepared to journal. So what I want you to do for next week, next Wednesday at this time, is I want you to read chapters two and three, because we're separating into the Bible, chapters two and three. And I want you to journal the questions at the end of them, because I'm going to ask you different questions next week for your, for your breakout session. I want you to be able to discuss some of those questions that you've already thought about and maybe journaled a little bit about during our question and answer period like that. I think that would be super helpful. So to read that. Uh, journal your questions, which would be marvelous. Um, and to invite anyone else, they can still join in. We'd still love having this part of the Center of Addiction and Faith. And we thank uh, my dear friend Louise Olson here, who was uh, one of the, the beautiful primary people responsible for getting this all together. <laughs> Our dear Pastor Ed Treat, who is the executive director of the Center of Addiction and Faith, is in the flight right now. He, he phoned me from uh, from the, the airport to wish us all well and to continue the mission of awakening faith communities. So I'm going to leave you. Uh, I thought we could all read together the uh, the closing prayer. This is on page 33. This is on page 33. Okay. And... Uh, We'll read it together as we bow our heads and we pray out loud, God and Father, giver of all good things, we know you have poured out your love and mercy on us like a fountain that washes us clean. Grant that we never turn from that love and mercy again, but turn to it and to you 
in all times of turmoil and tumult with childlike trust. Grant that we may embrace our own brokenness and draw nearer to you because of it. Just as we pray to see you in the suffering and brokenness of our brothers and sisters. May we never seek to be self-serving or self-sufficient. For of and by ourselves, we are just empty jars. Like the empty jars at Canaan, we pray you fill us with the wine of your benevolence and the will of your love. Amen. Amen. And uh, the next meeting is next Wednesday. This is a five-week series. Same time, same bat time, same bat channel. We'll see. <laughs> see everyone back if you don't have the book it is readily available on amazon the road to hope you could find it on our website ithirstinitiative.org um but it's on amazon that would probably be the easiest it's on bards and oh katie did that very good katie's posted in our chat the link right to the book um we will be um we will be meeting as i said we welcome additional people this is our course information every week we're going to be posting uh, how you can enroll in our course which begins next week here's my dear friend robin at the end of my class where is she this beautiful lady um and we are going to be really super thankful to have robin lavarado you beautiful girl we're just ending we're just ending oh no next week it's at one o'clock our time Next week, you join us. It's a five-week series. We'd love to have you. Robin runs the Essex Health and Wellness Center. She is a, a beautiful woman of faith that is bringing spirituality into our treatment facilities. She is single-handedly taking that on. And we are so thankful for her and for all the good work that she does. So listen, this is a disease of the brain. Eh, you, there's, a, there's a brain chemistry that has to... This is a disease of the mind. There is... Uh, and, and physiologically, there are, there are devastating health issues you can call it a brain disease you can even call it some people call it a bad moral moral choice or moral failing i say that's our gig anyway isn't it to reach out to those to reach out to those that have gone astray morally call it what you will call it a moral failing call it a moral failing call it a bad choice have you ever made a bad choice let's do, let's see what the root is of that pain at that that makes that choice Call it a bad choice, call it a moral failing, call it a brain disease, call it a spiritual disease, whatever you call it. We have a responsibility and an obligation as church to help in the spiritual healings of our brothers and sisters and their families who suffer. Amen? Amen. Love you all. I'll see you next week. Thank you for this journey. Class, I'll see you tonight. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. God bless you. See you soon.